Now, a small group of evacuees have briefly been allowed inside the exclusion zone around Japan's damaged Fukushima nuclear plant. For the first time, the government gave permission for short visits so people could gather belongings and check on their properties. Meanwhile, a recent map of contamination released by Japan shows high levels of radiation well outside the evacuation zone. Well, Dr. Robert Jacobs uh, can help shed more light on all this. He's a research associate professor of nuclear history history and culture at the Hiroshima Peace Institute. Dr. Jacobs, many thanks for being with us now. Uh, if radiation is high even beyond the zone, how can it now be safe to be letting people get closer? Um, it's not safe. Uh, this is a situation where they're letting the people go in one time in order to remove articles from their home, uh, typically a designated person in a family. Um, so that person will certainly have some exposure during that time. It shouldn't be sufficient in a period of going in for a few hours and leaving to be very threatening to their health. But the real threat is to the people who live in the contaminated areas outside of the exclusion zone. And it's now clear there have been for two months now, there have been measurements of high levels of radiation outside of the exclusion zone. And as we've heard, high levels present in the schools in the voluntary evacuation zone from 20 to 30 kilometers. Uh, and just this week, also, uh, radioactive sludge turned up in the sewage system of one of the nearby cities. So in just a period of less than two months, uh, the groundwater contamination has been sufficient to enter into the sewage system of a nearby town. So clearly, the levels outside of the zone are fairly high in well, some areas. Let's talk about some of the ambiguity still surrounding uh, radiation levels. Uh, those levels detected by workers inside the damaged reactor show that it is much higher than they expected. So uh, why aren't we getting more accurate readings since we're two months into the crisis now? Well, this is a reflection of the incredibly uh, small amount of information that even TEPCO and the Japanese government are operating with. Um, just in the last day or two, the government entered for the first time since the accident happened, entered into reactor number one. And the idea was that they were going to vent out the radiation that was contained in the building and begin to install a new cooling system. But once they entered into the building, they found that the levels inside were so high high that it became impossible to work there. They're now at such a high level that uh, one worker working for 10 minutes will receive a lifetime dose of exposure. So clearly, um, TEPCO and the government are still in the process of just beginning to learn what are the current conditions. So it's, a, it's very hard to solve these problems when you don't really know uh, what the sources of the radiation are. And of course, the situation's far from over, isn't it? There's speculation now that the fourth reactor is leaning and is in danger of falling. How great a concern is that? It's a very, very serious concern. Um, this, this began as speculation among those of us watching uh, the incident because on the webcam uh, in which you can watch, you can look at the four reactors, it began to be obvious that uh, building number four was leaning to the right a little bit from the visual field of the webcam. Um, and, and now, just tonight, actually, uh, in a release of information from the Japanese government, they have confirmed that there has been work started yesterday to shore up the structure of the building, and specifically the upper floor. Now, in this reactor, you have the spent fuel pool that is a much larger spent fuel pool. It has fuel rods from three to four reactors in there. And this part of the building is beginning to lean. And because of the explosion of reactor three, there is some questions about the structural integrity integrity of the building of Reactor 4, and if that were to collapse, you would have all of the fuel in that spent fuel pool just scattered about on the ground. And outside of increasing a uh, very, very high level of contamination, you would also have radiation rise to levels that would make it very problematic for workers to continue to work on the site at all. Now, just lastly and uh, briefly, if you would, Dr. Uh, Jacobs, from what you've been saying, it's clear that the situation at Fukushima does remain critical, yet the silence that we're getting is quite deafening isn't it? Why aren't we hearing more about a facility that's still at risk of causing great amounts of devastation? 
Well, in these situations, managing public opinion is as serious an operation as managing the crisis itself. Uh, you, what you have here in Fukushima is you have four reactors that are uh, all still emitting significant amounts of radiation into the environment. So this is not a situation that has been brought under control. It is a situation in which the large releases have been uh, largely, the explosions of the first uh, week have been gone past, but now we just have ongoing leakage. So to continue to tell people about that leakage and to continue to provide a lot of information about that leakage will cause higher levels of distress and also the perception that neither TEPCO nor the government is in control of the situation. So it's a lot easier to just Resi uh, reduce the amount of information that the public has uh, so that you're able to control the situation, at least from the point of view of uh, public opinion, and, uh, and keep people from panicking. Okay, Dr. Robert Jacobs from the Hiroshima Peace Institute. Many thanks for speaking to us about the ongoing situation at Fukushima. Many thanks.